Okay, this week in integrated range line management, we're going to switch gears and quit talking about fundamentals and start talking about interactions. So we're going to start this whole gig out with uh, the interactions between livestock and wildlife. And I hope to dispel some misconceptions and I hope that you'll correct me on some things that I believe to be true. I'm going to start out with a video uh, that is about um, Oregon ranchers and I think it captures a lot of what people, um, what ranchers and landowners feel about wildlife. A lot of times people, can, they pit uh, ranching and grazing against wildlife and I think there's a lot of common ground. So take a look at this video and, and let me know what you think. Oregon is a land of contrast. From its alpine forests, to its open eastern rangelands, to its big rivers and small streams, it's a land of silence and untouched natural wonders, where the Old West lives on and the dreams of the future sink roots and take hold. More than 12,000 ranching families call Oregon home. Many of them came here more than a century ago. Their ranches produce cattle, protect the state's natural landscape, and feed a growing world. And their careful stewardship of natural resources from open space, grasslands, rivers, and streams are also home to abundant wildlife. In fact, Oregon's ranches provide habitat for 70% of the state's wild animals ensuring ongoing and often unnoticed protection of forage, water, and large expanses of land. We cannot survive in a, in a livestock uh, farming uh, venue without uh, being good to the land. If, you, if we don't take care of it it, it, it is not possible to sustain our operations. And so by taking care of it, we also are taking care of wildlife and, and we're managing water, we're, we're um, taking care of, of the, uh, the natural environment, and that benefits all Oregonians. I think as ranchers, we would like people to know that we live every day, morning and night, with our wildlife, and we enjoy seeing them and watching them and we feel very protective about the wildlife that lives here with us. We have uh, all kinds of wildlife and these meadows are the prime time bottom ground, uh, the best land around. So the wildlife moves in and they have the best of the best to, pre to prepare themselves for, uh, for winter. Historically, there's been incidences where somebody will not, no longer want to raise cattle or on a place. He wants to just enjoy the wildlife, and it never seems to work. The wildlife are there for a while, but then they move on because that's not... Uh, they seek habitat that's being managed, and the wildlife don't like it when the, the, when the feed, the grasses they're driving the is not being harvested in an annual fashion like a, the grazing regimes that are in place. They don't like it there, so they just move over to where the next ranch is. What a lot of people don't understand is, is that relationship. That our, our stewardship of the state's wildlife is key to its survival. That, um, that what we do is, is paramount to the survival of the species. And, and without our input and the help of the ODF and W, it, it wouldn't be possible. Near Roseburg, the Sandberg family, who ranch in the Umqua Basin, have spent the last two decades helping to restore the once endangered Columbia white-tailed deer. Well, our ranching operation is a family operation. We raise a lot of cattle and a lot of sheep here in Douglas County. Um, our operation is both ranches that we own and that we lease. Well, when we first came to Douglas County uh, in 1980, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, help my father-in-law quite a bit. and and doing a lot of riding in the hills. I found myself uh, in the middle of these Colombian whitetail, uh, blacktail, turkeys, and I really enjoyed just riding along and seeing them and getting to understand that uh, they are part of the land here. The Colombian whitetail deer in Oregon are, are uh, found in two different areas, one on the lower Columbia River, both on the islands uh, in the Columbia and on the Washington and Oregon mainland. And the second population is located here in Roseburg, uh, Douglas County, primarily centered around the North Umpqua River. 
They were listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act in the 1970s and then listed under the State Endangered Species Act in the 1980s. And a recovery plan was formed to uh, try to meet certain criteria in order to qualify them for taking off the list. When we sat down as a family to create a management plan for the ranches we own and the ranches we leased, uh, we looked very hard to see what direction we wanted to take our program. So we started with a forage-based management plan in which we enlisted burning, prescribed burning. We enlisted uh, some farming practices, uh, growing perennial crops, uh, so we had crops for year-round use for our sheep and cattle. We've planted trees and we've got little oak patches that then whitetails seem to thrive in. Delisting couldn't be done without uh, the landowners, primarily the ag and livestock industry here in Douglas County. Over 95 percent of the deer uh, in the, this subpopulation reside on private land. The bottom line is that it was a joint effort between state government and this state agency in particular and private landowners and ranchers that helped get the Columbia white-tailed deer off the list. The evidence of course is that the population has tripled in the last 15 years from less than 2,000 animals to now we've, we estimate we've got between six and seven thousand. It's a sign that um, that as ranching progresses in the future and as people learn what you can do uh, maybe more and more species can be removed from the list. While ranching's contribution to wildlife goes often unnoticed, it's having a profound impact not only on the state's environment, but also its economy. A recent study by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife shows nearly 2.8 million people participated in wildlife-related activities in 2008. The total economic benefit of these things was $2.5 billion. How much of this would have been possible without committed wildlife stewardship from ranchers? People love to go see fish and wildlife. They love to go to that quality fish and wildlife habitat. And a lot of that habitat quality is really directly because of the work of private landowners and ranchers. Well, I think you've got to realize what most ranchers, what their love is. It's uh, love for animals and a compassion for animals and a love for the outdoors. and. With that in mind, you've got people that are out there trying to preserve that. Oregon's 50% owned by private people. Uh, a majority of that, uh, of the habitat for fisheries and wildlife is owned by private landowners and some of the best habitat. And they do a tremendous amount. Oregonians wouldn't be able to enjoy some of the benefits to fisheries and wildlife without the cooperation of private landowners. Ranchers in this state have a lot of land that they run their animals on. And so it's these folks that are out taking care of the land for their own animals that also provide an incredible environmental benefit for all of Oregon. We look at ourselves as really being the, the front line of protection to, to make sure that species don't go extinct. In Oregon, we've had, a, had tremendous support from the ranching community. Well, species like, like the sage grouse, uh, like the pronghorn, you know, in and of themselves, these are kind of iconic creatures that, that occupy the West. And to maintain uh, ranching and, and other uses that have occurred in the West for the last hundred or so years is, is really an, an important and integral part of, of keeping that conservation moving forward. Because without those players at the table and their support, it's going to be very difficult for us to, to move any sort of conservation effort forward. Without ranchers and, and uh, agriculture community, I think we'd have a lot less wildlife because they, a lot of the most productive lands are in private ownership. And you know what I found over the years is ranchers are very concerned about uh, fish and wildlife resources. You know, for us, it's uh, it's almost like heaven. I I, I can't imagine it being uh, much better than what it is for us when we get up in the morning and a crisp morning like this to see. Um, to see the, the wildlife and, and, and know that, that what we have done is has given them habitat and, and, and places to raise their young and, and, uh, and feed for the winter and uh, th there is just no feeling like it. Okay, there's a lot of things that we need to think about that were brought up in that video. And then we, there's a lot of assumptions that we need to make about managing livestock and wildlife. So first let me think about uh, 
I, I think it's clear from the video that um, ranchers care about the land, they care about wildlife. Um, maybe some of the things that were said in the video are, are misconceptions are certainly um, people that are really trying to tell a strong story about how um, wildlife and livestock interact because there certainly is a downside to that. So we're going to talk about both the positive and the downside to livestock wildlife interactions. But I think in no doubt we can understand that if you're going to care about wildlife you got to work with private landowners because they own a lot of the land that wildlife live on and they also own the most productive and the highest quality land because most of the land that has streams and um, and water and the highest you know quality soil is private land. So I, I hope that video gave you something to think about. And now let's look at a little bit more of the science. So if you're trying to integrate wildlife and livestock interactions on your piece of property, whether it be something you're managing or your own property, you have to make some uh, st starting point, some assumptions. And the first is, you got to remember that, that vegetation changes. Nothing stays the same. You're living in a world that's dynamic and it's it's drawn by a lot of natural and human-made forces. Some of those include succession. There's no way to stop succession. It's going to happen. It's nature's way to you know, fill the, fill the ground and, and populate the soil and, and keep the system going. But certainly you can understand succession and try to manage it and live with it. Invasive species, of course, are something that changes the productivity of land and the quality of land. Climate, um, climate change and weather are also things that influence what kind of resources are available and change. Catastrophic changes, especially now we talk a lot about these catastrophic wildfires because the wildfire regime has changed. But there's a whole bunch of other uh, eff effects that might um, influence vegetation and just remind us that vegetation is changing all the time. So if you're interested in range management because life is going to be easy and it's going to stay the same and if you figure it out it's all going to work, well I'm sorry. If you figure it out you're living in a really dynamic world and vegetation is going to change every year along the way and you've got to start with that assumption if you're going to manage livestock wildlife interactions. Another thing you need to assume is that most land is managed for multiple uses. There's this multiple use principle and most rangelands um, are managed under the idea that l land has many benefits, many ecological resources, many ecosystem services, and that you would probably not be a good manager if you didn't manage for that host of resources. Many of these multiple uses are mandated by law on public lands. The BLM, the Forest Service, um, are mandated by um, federal laws to uh, manage their lands for multitude of uses, including recreation, wildlife, livestock, grazing, um, historical value in some cases, etc., etc. There are a few kinds of public lands that have a mandate that is quite specific. Um, we've we talked about this in class and um, things like the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, um, to some degree parks, many parks have a single mandate to preserve some historic um, aspect. Um, and then also um, the National Wildlife Refuge System is designed for managing wildlife. So you can have grazing or other uses on the land provided they don't. Um, disenfranchise or interfere with wildlife. So most public lands have this idea that multiple uses is at the center of their land, but some agencies vary. And I would say that multiple use is desirable on, on most kinds of lands, again, because um, rangelands have a lot of ecological resources and ecological services to offer. And whether it be public or private land, most lands are managed under some level of, of multiple uses and wildlife and livestock are two of those. Another really important principle is, in my words, you can't, you can't please all the critters all the time. If you're going to manage the wildlife habitat for one species, you're going to um, disenfranchise or limit the value of that land for other species. There's certainly some a whole, whole cadres of species that work in concert and they have similar habitat requirements but no matter, once you pick a species, whether it be um, a big game, upland game, 
insects, uh, livestock, once you pick a species you're going to uh, disenfranchise other species. So um, we have this management focus on one species that will probably compromise others. This is one problem that's often um, brought up about the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act is a one species at a time act. Um, it's not a habitat act. It's not the Endangered Habitat Act. It's about what is it going to take to manage one species and sometimes that compromises the value for others. So we'll talk a little bit about that more in this class and you, you probably have some thoughts about endangered species that you've worked with. Some kind of broad principles, terms that are used when about managing critters um, and groups of critters. Um, ecosystem management processes are often, those ideas are founded on the idea that um, you should manage the, to keep the ecosystem healthy and that that will benefit a large group of species. Also the idea of umbrella species, for example, sage grouse has been defined or has been discussed as an umbrella species. So you can manage for sage grouse, but if you make habitat that is appropriate for sage grouse, it might also benefit a whole set of other species, including sage thrashers and pygmy rabbits and, and many insects and just a whole host of animals that if the habitat a require, if the habitat was at a level that was beneficial to sage grouse, that that would have a whole set of other species under that umbrella. So those are just two terms that if you follow this literature, you've probably seen those. Uh, some other assumptions. If you're going to manage for livestock and wildlife, you really have to understand the local ecosystem functions on your ranch or your property because, wow, it, this is a very place-specific endeavor. The resources and opportunities you have are going to be very different than someone right down the road. You also have to understand laws and policies because they will regulate, they will manage, they will set sidebars on what you can and cannot do in terms of laws like the National Environmental Policy Act, um, the Federal Lands um, Management um, Policy Act, the FLIPMA, um, also the Endangered Species Act, uh, water quality, uh, all of these policies and laws influence what you can and cannot do. And then finally, success depends on your ability to bargain and negotiate. Um, you can know all that you want about biology, but your ability to describe that and bring other people to understand your point of view or to understand their point of view, your ability to bargain and negotiate is going to influence what you can or cannot do on land. Okay, so as you think about livestock wildlife interactions, is it good or bad? Um, well, the answer is it depends. Um, a few weeks ago in this class, we talked about um, managing gra grazing systems for wildlife habitat, and I asked if it was good or bad. And I think I made the point that um, that it really depends. It depends on which species. So if you're talking about wildlife habitat, you really need to define which species you're talking about. So here's a whole host on this slide of wildlife and livestock and the interactions may be positive or benefit depending on the place and space that you are in. One of the articles that I'm having you read this week is an article by Marty Vavra and it's talk he talks about competition and compatibilities between livestock and wildlife. And in his article he says it's very important to think about what competition is. Just because two animals are in the same space at the same time, it doesn't mean that they're comp competing. And we often hear this sort of in casual conversation that, you know, for example, elk and deer are competing. Well, m Dr. Vavra points out some really important points. He says that competition only occurs, from a classic point of view, competition only occurs if both species are using the same resource. For example, they have similar diet requirements or similar space requirements. Secondly, that the resources in short supply. If um, all of us are eating uh, pizza at the uh, at the restaurant, that's no problem as long as there's plenty of pizza. It's on, We're only going to compete for pizza if pizza is in short supply. And the same with, let's say, elk and cattle on the range. They're not going to be in a competitive situation unless grass is in short supply. And then finally, in order to have real true competition, at least one of the species has to um, have limited fitness um, because of the interaction. In other words, at least one of those two species has to lose weight, lose fertility, 
lose um, a healthy um, condition, lose body condition, lose fecundity, there has to be some loss among one of those species in order to have true competition. So you can't throw that term competition just loosely out there. It really has at least these three elements um, before you can show that there's competition. And that's why in the literature, in the scientific literature, it's very hard to prove true competition because in order to do that you have to have these three components. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about some of the positive impacts of grazing, livestock grazing on wildlife, and then we'll talk about some of the negative impacts because it really does depend. Um, certainly proper management and, and really responsible management can maintain high quality water which can be good for both livestock and wildlife. It could improve um, forage quality for wildlife. Um, often one of the greatest benefits of livestock, especially for big game, is that livestock can be used because they can be managed with fences and with stocking rates. They can be used to remove the really kind of wolfy and dormant parts of grasses and make them more valuable to wildlife. So I think I've said this before in class, but oftentimes we hear that elk do not like to be with cattle. Well, it's not. that's not actually true. Elk actually like to follow the cattle because the cattle um, will often graze off the, that wolfy material, that, that decadent material. So the, the elk will often come after the cattle. So whether they tolerate them or not, I, I don't actually know. I just know that oftentimes wildlife, elk and deer, especially big game, love to follow livestock because livestock have taken care of getting rid of some of that dormant material and the forage quality is often higher. Um, you also can manage habitat and cover for wildlife, but in order to do a good job of management, the, the land manager has to understand what the habitat and cover requirements are for wildlife. So certainly, a poor manager can abuse this, and if they don't know what wildlife need, what specific wildlife um, habitat requirements are, uh, you can cause, you can wreak havoc with livestock. But if you know what those requirements are and you know how to manage livestock, you can surely manage habitat and cover for wildlife. In, in best of situations, you can improve wildlife habitat populations, not, not only just wildlife habitat, but also their populations. And so in the best situations, you might see a, a place where, wildlife, where livestock are managed really well and they, are, um, um, they improve the land in such a case that, ha that the populations respond. Um, this is what we saw in that first video, the Cl Columbia Valley um, deer that those white-tailed deer really responded to the management and they improved their populations and so now they have been apparently delisted so uh, because of the good work of land managers and livestock managers uh, we've been able to manage that habitat. Here now there's some other positive impacts. Um, we know that by using livestock carefully we can improve forage quality. Let me give some examples for small mammals and upland game birds. Upland game birds, such as the sage grouse, um, primarily need forbs and seeds and insects because remember they are not, they cannot ferment uh, cellulose, so they really are concentrate selectors. Well, livestock in grazing the grass can really promote the abundance of those forbs and those seeds and those insects. So they uh, grazing. Can produce um, can reduce the competition from grasses and increase the energy-rich seeds that often come from forbs. There is a challenge in managing the cover attributes needed for these small mammals and game birds, so uh, we have to maintain a, a good cover for those critters. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, if you wanted to promote forbs on rangeland, you need to reduce grasses. So grazing grasses with cattle or sheep or horses generally, result, generally results in forbs. And then um, finally, um, a small mammals and birds really do require, require insects. So um, insects like um, grass, um, I'm sorry, like in ants and beetles, are, they really benefit from grazing. So there's more ants in grazed pastures than ungrazed pastures, for example. And that's because when ants set up their um, their mounds, they need to get rid of vegetation. And it's awful handy to have some large herbivorous mammals around, like cows or sheep, to reduce that vegetation for them. So 
Um, there have been some studies done by Steve Cook at the University of Idaho that show that their ants are more abundant in grazed pastures than ungrazed pastures. Also, many of the beetles and small um, insects, non-flying insects that sage grouse and, um, and small mammals need to survive, they're very high in protein. They're dung, they're dung animals, they're dung beetles. So part of their life cycle, cycle is spelt, spent in the dung of cattle and other large animals. So again, dung beetles are also animals, or are also little animals that are found and um, really benefit from livestock grazing. So in many ways, we could use grazing to improve habitat and forage for small mammals and upland game birds. The next point about cover is one to really keep your eye on. Um, especially with sage grouse and nesting um, requirements, this has come to um, really to the forefront. The same plants that are good under shrubs and good for cover are the same grasses that cattle especially like to eat for cover. So I think as long as we know what those requirements are, we can sure manage around them. But irresponsibly, we could also damage cover attributes for especially small mammals and upland game birds. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are times when reduction of cover um, is also beneficial. For example, uh, ground squirrels, small rodents, um, prairie dogs, all of those animals, those rodents, um, they benefit from grazing and from the removal of, of herbaceous plants. Um, birds of prey also benefit in grazed areas because they um, consume the rodents. So when grazers come through, they reduce the forage, they reduce the cover, and they make rodents more apparent. So birds of prey can also benefit then from the reduction of cover. So we've got to keep our eye on what their cover requirements are for the wildlife species that we're trying to manage. Other positive attributes. We know that livestock grazing can, if done right, improve habitat. Here's a bunch of examples. One, just in general, we know that grazing can create patchy and mosaic patterns. Um, it can get, create habitat with high structural diversity. So if you think back to your uh, wildlife biology classes that you may have taken, um, high structural diversity is something that is often beneficial to many wildlife species. Grazing can create those patchy habitats to provide that. Um, um, they can open up dense vegetation. At time, vegetation is difficult for humans and or wildlife to travel through, and we find this often around uh, streams and um, ponds. And so there are several wildlife management areas where livestock are used to really just kind of, uh, livestock in this case, cattle, are used to reduce the biomass and open up some of that dense vegetation canopy. Um, they can create feeding, nesting, and hiding sites uh, through the structural diversity. Grazing can really improve the feeding sites, the location relative to nesting sites and hiding sites. Again, it just depends on amount and spatial distribution of those resources. Um, another real benefit of grazing is that uh, grazers, such as cattle and horses and, and sheep, can if grazed at the right time, encourage the establishment of shrubs. And many um, big game require shrubs in the winter because, as we know, shrubs are good sources for energy and for um, nutrients in the winter. So at times when you need to, to create important winter shrubs, such as bitterbrush, uh, grazing in the spring is really a necessary requirement because um, grazing reduces the competition from grasses and allows the shrubs to persist. So those are all ideas that relate to grazing and patchy mosaics. Um, bottom line is that those are attributes of selective grazing. Um, things that grazing can do through really targeted or selective grazing is it can create travel corridors, again, breaking up some of the really dense vegetation and allowing corridors for wildlife to pass through. Removing dense and rank grass is often viewed as something that livestock can do uh, and then uh, that benefits wildlife because it um, allows the young grass to grow up and wildlife can use that. Stimulate browsing to, product, um, browsing to produce and especially to form seeds by reducing grass biomass. Again, cows are really good at doing that in the spring. And then finally the use of livestock to manage weeds and, weeds and fire risk. 
both uh, weeds and fire risk are important problems for many wildlife species and if we were careful we could use livestock to manage those two risks. But just a few good examples in the literature about how livestock can really be used to benefit wildlife habitat. Um, the first is mountain plovers and dove. Both of these animals really require large open landscapes. Dove, for example, need sort of dusting areas. They need areas where there is some open ground. They also need areas where there is, um, you know, very little uh, structural um, components right at the ground surface, which is what mountain plovers do. So for these species, using cattle, for example, to reduce the amount of uh, biomass and, and open up the country can really benefit those species. Cattle and sheep can also be used to manage upland game birds. Again, they do this by um, increasing forb competition and insects, reducing the, um, the competition from grasses. Uh, uh, however, the, the caveat of that is just make sure that uh, the, that grazing is not so heavy that you reduce cover for those upland game birds. There's a whole host of studies about where cattle have been used to remove that rank um, dead old grass that promotes, promotes the regrowth of grass and promotes elk and deer quality of forage, especially in the fall. So livestock go through in the spring and summer they create an opportunity for regrowth in grasses and deer and elk can benefit from that regrowth in the form of improved fall forage quality. Um, oftentimes it's a fairly small increase in crude protein but it's a really important increase because as deer and elk um, go into the winter they need high quality forage. So There's been a number of studies in Oregon and Washington that, um, that have shown that, that cattle grazing can improve the forage quality for deer and elk. Horses and cattle have been also been used in several studies in Utah and Colorado to reduce um, the grass competition and, and improve shrubs. So by grazing in the winter, late winter and spring, that increases, increases the shrub abundance that animals will need over the winter. And then finally, again in, in Colorado and Utah, um, many wildlife species there rely on the the oak brush, Gamble's oak, and sometimes that brush can get um, kind of decadent and and really dense and goats can be brought in to revitalize those stands. So there have been a few studies where goats were used to revitalize the, the dense Gamble's oak stands. Okay, so that's all the great things that livestock can do to benefit wildlife, but there's also some real downsides. So you can't tell just part of the story, you got to tell the whole story. So there's many times where improper grazing can really be detrimental to wildlife and wildlife habitat. For example, cattle and sheep can reduce nest sites for upland game birds and wildlife. Um, there haven't been a lot, of the next point, they can trample nests. There haven't been a lot of, um, of studies that have really showed that livestock trample nests, it does occur but probably a more important factor of livestock being around nests is just disturbing the nests and um, causing the animals to flush off their nests because a, a big cow or a large sheep going along and um, and just walking along can disturb nest, uh, the nesting hen. Um, decreased water quality is definitely a problem and when we talk about salmonids and, and streams, um, salmon, bull trout, etc. We, we have a lot of concern over the um, quality of the stream um, green line, the, the area where the vegetation comes right to the stream bed, and how that um, grazing might reduce that uh, integrity of the stream edge and decrease water quality. Uh, large animals can also disturb big game during fawning and calving like elk calving. Uh, reduce cover to hide from predators. So here in this picture we have a mule deer from the Umatilla National Wildlife Refuge and this, this little deer is trying to um, hide from predators and young deer are very good at that and when you reduce forage abundance it makes it harder and harder for those young animals to hide from predators. And then furthermore, not only that, but livestock are also a, a pretty good magnet for predators but also for disease and parasites. So when you have livestock in the area, they may actually attract coyotes or wolves or um, mountain lions to the area, and then that can be detrimental to deer and elk and rabbits and birds. 
Um, so all of these things would be aspects of just the presence of livestock and certainly can be aspects of improper grazing. We can manage some of these, um, but some of them are just in, a, in unmanageable aspects of having livestock in the area. Can't talk about livestock without talking about ranches. Um, livestock come with livestock operations come with this whole um, set of accoutrements that relate to ranching. And so don't forget that the human activities, the structures, the fences, all of those come along with a livestock operation. And they can be beneficial or they can be negative depending on the species and depending on how the improvement or the aspect on the land is used. So for example, water. Water can be highly beneficial to wildlife. They can use it um, for their own needs. Uh, they, that you know, There's a, uh, some studies I've read about um, pronghorn expanding across the west and one of the things that has really helped their expansion across the west and their use of habitat is the development of water for livestock. So that can be beneficial but also probably most of us have seen um, come up to a cow tank and seen dead animals in the cow tank. So unless um, good um, ladders are made so animals can get out of cow tanks they can also be death traps. So there's two sides to that. They could also be disease magnets and also magnets for weeds and disturbance. So positive or negative, depending on how it's done and depending on how it's used. Fences. Fences are in the news a lot these days. Um, some fences can be beneficial to some wildlife species, especially um, uh, game. Or I'm sorry, uh, predatory birds like hawks and crows and ravens. Um, but they can also be a problem for many species, uh, especially they're in the news because of the, the fact that we know that wild that uh, sage grouse can hit fences fairly easily. Um, and so there's been a lot of work to try to put markers on fences to reduce um, animals hitting those fences, um, in this case sage grouse, and that's worked pretty well. Other animals are just less able to deal with fences, such as pronghorn, which like to go other under fences. So some changes maybe need to be made to the fences that we have to really allow um, animals like pronghorn to to move across the landscape without being interrupted by fences. Other animals seem sort of unaffected by fences. So how influenced any animal on the land is from a fence just really depends on their skill and their um, you know their size and their abilities. One thing most people agree on, and it certainly came up in that first video, is the idea that large blocks of lands that are maintained by livestock operations are beneficial to most wildlife. So most wildlife managers in the West, I think, would agree that ranches are a really important part of the mix. They're really important in keeping those large, large blocks of lands available without fences or without roads, without a lot of activity. Weed control can go two ways. Yes, livestock can promote weeds. They can bring weeds into an area. They can uh, reduce competition from native plants to promote weeds. On the other hand, um, studies have been done that show that ranches generally have less weeds than parks and, and refuges because ranchers know how to control weeds. They have the equipment to do it and they, they recognize them because it affects their livestock um, operation. So there's sort of two sides to that weed control coin. Um, no doubt ranching creates its own set of disturbances. Cowboys going by, trucks going by, fences, equipment, those sorts of things. So disturbances are, are something that, that ranches bring to the landscape that may or may not affect wildlife. So in this next video, um, I'm going to, to uh, show you a video where there's just a local rancher in Idaho who he brings in um, what the uh, aspects of his ranch are that influence the land, but he also brings in a love for the land. So let's let's listen to Roy Schwankfelder and his family and how they have tried to keep on ranching but has also made a place for wildlife through improvements on the land. Royce and Pam Schwankfelder run the SS Cattle Company in the Little Weezer Valley near Cambridge, Idaho. The broad valley is framed by snow-streaked mountain peaks. From their home, they can see the whole panorama of the mountains 
the valley, and their ranch. We've been coming here for um, quite a few years. Come up with uh, on the horses or the four wheeler or whatever, and, and um, we've always this has just kind of been our spot since we got married, and always looked out over the country and and uh, thought that if we could ever build a house someday, this would be where we would build it. It gives you good perspective, you know. It's 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 beautiful country. We get to look out on, on the crops and the cattle, and, and uh, you know, it's just a it's a pretty place to be on earth. We love it. It's been a great place to raise kids. Uh, you know, they get to go out and get their hands dirty and, and understand where their food comes from and, and uh, ride a horse and, and uh, appreciate some of the basics in life. There's a lot of value in what you find that, in, that you do in life and, and, uh, and the things you kind of hold sacred that you learn with a piece of dirt. The Schwenk builders raised two daughters on the ranch, Kayla and Cody. Their youngest daughter, Kayla, left her mark on the ranch with an award-winning wildlife management project. A pair of sandhill cranes flushed from a pond when we approached. It's kind of one of those fun things when you have when you have the opportunity to live on this beautiful ranch. You can have five acres to do whatever you want with, and uh, and a family that's willing to give up the five acres to do it to let you you know make your dream come true. We try to create a place where there's shelter, there's water, and there's food. So just trying to uh, appeal, I guess, to all different types of wildlife. If you build it, they will come, and it's it's amazing. You'll see geese out here, and swans, and you know ducks, mallards, and uh, buffleheads, and just a variety of, of wildlife, and it, it's great. She got a national award for it, and uh, she got some scholarships that came out of that. So. You know, being an FFA wasn't just about having cows for her, it was doing other stuff and making kind of a balance on the ranch of, of wildlife and cattle. And so that kind of started the ball rolling and we just tried to continue that. When I graduated from high school and went to college, uh, you know, I, I have to give it to my dad. He, he ran with it. <laughs> I mean, I come home and I'm like, man, how many more ponds have you built? An overarching theme at the Schwenkfelder Ranch is sustainability. Some years ago, they switched to raising Red Angus cattle, a breed that Roy says is best suited to the climate and capacity of the land. In every end of the country, from Florida to, to northern Canada, there's a different cow that will fit in a different environment. And, and so we have to find a, an animal and, and the style of animal that would fit here. And, and so that's kind of what we're trying to do. There's a lot of things that the cow guys do on that ground that is a stewardship type thing because we want it to be good next year. We want to, to do it right and, and, and this range is a renewable resource. I'm going to finish up with just bringing a few comments back to how we can use grazing systems to influence wildlife. Um, we can use strategic rest and deferment to improve nesting cover. So if we know what animals are nesting and what kinds of lands are that we're using, we can keep livestock out of those lands and really be careful about how they are managed. We can remove livestock from fawning areas and reduce that disturbance. Again, if we just pay attention, know where animals are using those lands, where wildlife are using those lands, and remove livestock when necessary. Um, but remember that heavy stocking in some pastures may be necessary. Some wildlife really do appreciate those heavily grazed areas and those that create sort of weedy patches. Again, animals like um, like morning doves uh, do like that sort of nesting area. And that you often find some animals right around water troughs where the, an the land is really heavily used. Uh, so don't always assume that just because that the land looks very untouched, that that's really good for all wildlife. Some wildlife really do like a level of disturbance. So stocking other pastures with moderate rates to create high quality regrowth is important, while other pastures in that same situation may have no grazing, and other pastures may have very heavy grazing. Uh, again, depending on your wildlife goals, uh, you can use livestock to accomplish them if you really understand the habitat needs of that species. Um, so again, I'm just going to summarize by saying that livestock and wildlife interactions can be good or bad. 
it really depends on a lot of aspects. It depends on the species of interest, the specific situation, uh, the kinds of plants that are there, the topography, the cover, and then finally, I hope, in this class, we learn that those sorts of things depend on the skill of the manager. If we understand the requirements for wildlife, we have strict wildlife habitat management goals, and we understand the, the requirements and habits of livestock, we can make a lot, a lot of win, win situations on the range. So in this next video, I want to uh, just highlight the work that the Natural Resources Conservation Service does to work with landowners and help them create wildlife habitat. And again, we're going to learn about a new wild, um, endangered species, in this case a salamander, and um, how a rancher is trying to improve the habitat for this endangered species. Conservation practices can improve a variety of landscape features for both livestock and wildlife, such as open grasslands, riparian areas, and forested areas. I'm Tim Copeman, a fourth generation livestock producer in Sonol, California. We own about 900 acres here. Uh, it was bought in 1918 by my grandfather and uh, great uncle. We run uh, about 150 mother cows. Basically, it's bigger than a hobby and smaller than a living. Uh, we have an abundance of wildlife species, uh, avian species, birds, uh, mammals, as well as reptiles and, uh, and amphibians that we're, we're taking a great deal of pride in what we've got out here. Today we're out looking at Tim Coatman's livestock pond for um, taking an inventory of what's actually in the pond. Tim's ranch is a really great ranch um, for wildlife habitat. Through the development and repair of some of the stock ponds we've had, we've been able to uh, provide stronger, better habitat for the California tiger salamander, which is an endangered species both federally and at the state level. Uh, one of the breeding ponds that we've got for the California tiger salamander, we've managed that with a specific grazing program to make sure that we maintain the right size and height of vegetation going away from the pond so that ingress and egress of the little guys when they move out after breeding that can successfully get through, uh, through the thatch and through the grass without being uh, prey bait for, for birds and other species. Not only do the aquatic features on the ranch provide good habitat for the wildlife, also the upland areas, the grassland areas provide excellent wildlife habitat. Well, to me, wildlife habitat is an indicator of the successful way that you're managing the ranch. So anything that you can do to get some help from the NRCS folks is going to help not only the wildlife, but probably your economic base and your function as well. On a ranch like Tim's, the primary forage here is non-native annual grasslands. And since that isn't our native vegetation, it has to have a certain amount of management to maintain as much of a diversity of habitat as possible for a variety of, of benefits to both the species, to his livestock, and fire suppression if you have that much of, of vegetation on your property. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to keeping livestock on annual grasslands in an area like this. We've developed a conservation plan with the Natural Resource Conservation Service in conjunction with the local resource conservation district. And in that conservation plan, we determined that there were some locations where we could add additional water supplies in the uplands areas and enhance our, our usability of the ranch itself. We see deer using those troughs. We see a variety of animals using those troughs. And the birds really like the trough. In that regard, we did put escape ramps and walk down ramps into every one of our water troughs so the birds can successfully go down, get a drink, and safely walk back out. Your local NRCS field office offers farmers and ranchers technical assistance for developing a dynamic and individualized conservation plan regardless of the size of your property. We work with ranchers in our area that are, you know, 5,000 acre ranches down to three acre ranches. They also have some funding sources that we were able to use uh, through EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. If you would like more information on wildlife habitat on rangeland, or other conservation practices, contact the district conservationist at your local NRCS office or visit our website. 
Okay, before we stop, let's just talk about the ways that animals can interact. I said it depends. I said sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. Go back to your biology and ecology and think a little bit about what those relationships are. Um, uh, here are the names of those kinds of relationships. When two animals benefit from the interaction, that would be called mutualism. Um, when one animal benefits and the other has no effect, that's comensalism. When one animal benefits and the other is harmed, that's an, an antagonistic relationship or antagonism. When neither benefits, neither animal benefits or neither animal is harmed, that's neutralism in the center of this slide. And the only one we haven't talked about is where both animals are harmed in the interaction. So take a look at this and now think about some interaction between livestock and wildlife that might be mutualistic. When might two animals really benefit? from a relationship. Okay, now just for fun, think about a situation where there's really no effect between the livestock and the wildlife. I'm just going to go down to the right hand s corner of the slide then, and I think it's pretty easy to think about um, when the relationship between livestock and wildlife is competitive, and there's a competition that we see. In other words, both animals are using the same resource, the resource is limited and the animals lose some level of production or um, reproduction in the relationship. Okay, in this next slide I've given you some examples that I've had in class in the past. Okay, before we stop, let's just talk about the ways that animals can interact. I said it depends. I said sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. Go back to your biology and ecology and think a little bit about what those relationships are. Um,